Good afternoon, everyone. I, I, I hope that uh, the other the other working groups were as uh, lively and uh, productive as I as I think ours was. Um, those of you who took notes in the working groups, you may have tweeted them out. You may have done other things. But if you could send me an email with the link, uh, what I want to do is to put links to all of the working group notes on the website so that uh, people can look through the notes of the sessions they weren't able to attend. Um, so if you could just do that uh, soon. Uh, also, uh, Lisa found an iPhone. Is anyone missing an iPhone? I don't have an iPhone. Okay. <laughs> My, my daughter has been begging for an iPhone, so <laughs> I wasn't planning to get her one, but uh, all right. Well, if... How many likes does she need? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> More than Facebook can provide. Is there a mom on there? Just call mom. Oh, yeah. I'll get someone else to do that, because I would be terrified to do such a thing. Um, all right, so we're in our last session. Um, and I want to explain briefly what I was sort of hoping to do here. I've talked with everyone up at front, but um, uh, those of you who may have been at Sharp this year, um, they did something that I found kind of nifty for the last session, where they had different people who had been at the conference uh, kind of stand up and talk about what they'd seen and what they thought was exciting about the work that was going on, um, where they saw the sort of challenges and the opportunities for the field uh, moving forward. Uh, and I just, I liked that format quite a bit. And so uh, I've asked our uh, panelists on this session, uh, who I think need no introduction, but, but Meredith and Lisa and Elizabeth and Ellen to, um, to do the same. Um, not necessarily just from this gathering, but to talk a bit about these different fields that we've tried to bring together here. Uh, bibliography, book history, American literature, um, American history, uh, media studies, digital humanities, all these things. Um, talk about some of these sort of opportunities and challenges that they see moving forward, potentials for collaboration. Um, uh, yeah, and just to sort of let us bask in their wisdom for a little while. Um, so the, the, way, the way that I anticipate this working is really sort of starting as a conversation with the, with the, the folks up front, and then eventually kind of bleeding into a larger conversation in, in the room. Um, and that, that's really what I have, so I, I will turn things over. Why don't you start on that end, because we, we saw less of the conference than we did. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I haven't even finished going through all my notes, mm. so I feel at a disadvantage, but I will. Uh, you know, of course, both Meredith and Lisa, as, you know, as the rest of you know, missed hearing the secrets of the universe by coming late to the conference. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, something you can always tell your class, your yeah. students when they arrive <laughs> half an hour late. Um, you know, so much has been, it's a been, you oh, can't read here, okay. It's been, I have a cold, I'll, I'll try. It's been such a rich conference, and I think one of the themes that's run, you know, periodically surfaced is the question of materiality, of, of paper itself. Jonathan started us off with that, with that wonderful presentation on uh, on paper and and see and, and helping us think about where does that come where does where do we lose that understanding of of how people actually held something and his compelling image of the books made out of underwear but uh, but beyond that that wonderful image of the Dutch paper with the bits of straw in it is such a I think a resonant one that is we only see it because it's been digitized, but we only know it has straw in it because he drew a little circle around it and pointed an arrow to it and told us, because we wouldn't really notice that on screen without doing that. So we're learning, I think, from a lot of these presentations about the importance of both the relationship to the, the material object, to the actual newspaper, to the experience of reading through newspapers, as, um, as, as Laura was telling us, that, that's different from being able to scan and, and process the data of thousands of them. And yet, these fabulous new tools of processing, of, of scanning through, of learning from the data of, of an immense database <coughs> is also uh, scaling something else. We were just talking in the previous workshop 
now about this question, what, what, about this question of what new scholarly questions come to us, uh, you know, are possible as a result of working digitally. And so, there was some discussion, you know, if you ran your old research through these new tools, would you get the same answers? Would you, you know, would you back up your earlier suppositions based on a much more limited sample? Um, do we have a new set of obligations now uh, to a sense of um, of represent representativeness that, at least for the non-historians in the room, we weren't so bound to before? Um, how lovely. Um, <laughs> and that, that we... <laughs> Okay. Um, so music too becomes part of the soundscape. Awesome. Good. That was quick. Okay. The soundscape that we we enter as well, of course, becomes part of of the data that we consider. Um, but there are so many different ways that we're rehashing. We're both rehashing old data, uh, looking at it through new eyes with new paradigms, um, as Thomas Kuhn would would have said, but I, and we were hearing in the previous session that scientists, <laughs> a bunch of scientists, writers, writers were saying, Kuhn, who's he? Um, but that, that idea that we are, we are really, you know, we can shake things up and at the same time we want to go deeper into what we've already investigated. Um, let's see, I wanted to think some more also just about that play between materiality and the digital that I think was, has been particularly resonant in a lot of the presentations uh, here. Um, I'm thinking of, 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 um, of Laura's piece on, on reading 19th century newspapers. What is it like to read them in the archives, these immense sheets that you, what are you going to do, crawl over them? It's, you know, they, they're really not going to let you do that at the AAS, as nice as they are. And, and you, you know, but we are not approximating the experience of the actual 19th century reader, even as we want to. And in some ways, maybe reading it on the small screens, maybe reading it on our iPhones might actually be more like folding up the paper and reading it on the subway, uh, as someone might have done. Not, not the 1840s ones, obviously, <laughs> but uh, a little later. So where, you know, where are those balances? What, what are we coming to? Um, so those are just, uh, I'm not asking big general questions. I'm, I'm sort of zipping in and out and, and thinking about different ways that this has been uh, generated for thinking about, about how we use texts, about how we use digital media. Um, and I, uh, rather than keep blathering, I hope other people will jump in and then we can have more of a conversation while I have time to look at my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ellen. Um, well, let me, let me just start by... Uh, by thanking all of you for um, for being here and for this terrific conversation that we've had over the past couple of days, um, I have thoroughly enjoyed myself, <laughs> <laughs> and I was sort of reflecting on one of the reasons why I've enjoyed myself um, here um, more more so perhaps than at um, a number of uh, sort of straight up digital humanities conferences that I've been to. Um, which is maybe outing me as a traditional scholar, um, but the uh, um, but I think w one of the things that's been most um, compelling for me is the uh. exactly the aim of this conference, which was to say, um, as we move into using digitized materials, how does that really respond to um, the questions that are germane to the field itself? That is, to the field of um, uh, literary studies, bibliographic studies, uh, textual studies. And those, the intersections of those questions um, and, and the kind of poignancy of those intersections is what's oh. been most compelling to me about this um, conference. So first of all, I, I've, I've seen m very many fabulous projects. So it's just exciting to see the work that is, um, that is going on. Um, and I wanted to just um, mention two um, uh, that, that that really had um, those those sort of moments of resonating in my mind um, uh, to bring forward particular points that I've been thinking about, um, and the the first is um, 
uh, those two are Ed Whitley's and um, Chauvin Seniors, who happen to be nicely sitting next to each other. <laughs> so, the, um, but Ed, so Ed's talk was about the um, uh, this Bohemian community in New York that he was mapping, um, doing a digital mapping of, and um, and beyond elaborating this fabulous new t term called Moriarty's Moriarty's principle, um, <laughs> which uh, for those of you who who weren't there has to do with um, uh, thinking that you've solved something digitally, but it, it, in truth, the um, the uh, underpinnings are just analog after all. <laughs> um, but the um, but what he pointed out was that he started on this digital project, and then as a result of this digital project, this materials online, a group of scholars got very interested in this material, uh, worked on a conference, and then put together a print volume. Right. So the question was 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 this sort of moving away from the digital back into print somehow a um, falling backwards or not. Um, and he was arguing that it wasn't, and I couldn't agree more that, that it's actually that moving back and forth that is incredibly exciting. And the reason why that's exciting is um, the questions of what kinds of communities become available through the, the digital access and, and through the print access. So this question of what communities are formed around print what communities are formed around digital information, I think, is a is a really crucial one, and one that is germane to many of the talks that we've that we've seen today, and that our sense of those communities can't be given in advance. That that we can't just cite Benedict Anderson and say that it's that it's national. That actually is the particular particularity of those communities and their particular relations to the artifacts of information that's interesting. And Chauvin's uh, paper uh, talk is similar in saying, you know, what is the community? Um, she was talking about uh, um, archives of um, indigenous uh, uh, Native American literature and the difference between um, the archive that you might find in a library and the archive that you would find in a tribal elder's garage, for instance. Um, and the ways in which there were archival traditions in many tribes in New England that are not represented in traditional archives. And her interest in, in moving um, uh, to a digital format to try to capture that, um, but the difficulties of doing so as well. And the one, uh, one moment that resonated from, for me from that talk is um, she was talking about the, um, uh, the project at Yale um, uh, doing um, what is it called? The Native American Yale Indian Papers. Yale Indian Papers, right? Um, so the Yale Indian Papers, which she was, you know, praising as having done a a, a, a really good job of working um, with um, uh, the tribes on these materials, but she said, um, <coughs> but of course that's a colonial archive, right? right. And um, and I think that's a really important point to say. Um, uh, what does it what does it mean to be a colonial archive, and what would um, what would a non-colonial archive look like? And uh, Jonathan pointed out that the NEH funding uh, principles also adhere to certain kinds of um, uh, regimes of colonial, colonialism, a colonial authority, knowledge, power. Um, so I think that um, uh, asking that question as well, how is that colonialism embedded in the archive? What, how might we think, th think that through and respond to that? Um, not only in the past, but in the present is a really important question. And that leads me to what, um, what I, uh, what I want to sort of, um, the main point I want to underline is that what, what's exciting about the work that's being done here is the humanities thinking that's being brought to the digital. Because that question of what's the colonial archive and what's a non-colonial archive, that is a humanities question. That's what humanities scholars know how to think about, know, know how to um, uh, begin to parse and um, uh, critique and make sense of. And those questions came to the fore again and again and again in the talks that we had. So that, um, uh, that what it means to build a database is to first figure out what the data is. And as you move towards the data, it gets more and more difficult to define what those what those materials are um, at the material level or at a conceptual level, and those arguments about what constitutes the data, those are the most interesting arguments, and that's what we as humanities <coughs> scholars, um, I think, really have to bring to the digital. 
Um, and my last sort of manifesto point would be that the, um, there's a way in which I think in the contemporary uh, academy, um, people are interested in funding the digital humanities because it looks so much less squishy than the humanities, right? Mm -hmm. There's a kind of STEMI feel to the digital humanities <laughs> that um, <laughs> makes administrators happier to send money in that direction in an era when the humanities are in crisis. Um, so there's a certain notion that the digital is somehow going to save the humanities, but I think the humanities is going to save the digital instead. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. Uh, uh, I want to thank um, uh, thank you, you know, all for being here, but also for the invitation. It's great to be here um, and to hear about some of your work. And let me apologize for not being here yesterday. It was just the press of other business kept me away. Um, but I want to sort of pick up uh, maybe something, exactly what Elizabeth was saying at the end about humanities thinking, and, and just register how, how extremely rare um, and how precious it is to see these different small areas of the humanities in conversation with one another. And I'm thinking of um, book history and American literary history, as well as DH, media studies, and bibliography. Um, those are all you know, sort of overlapping, intersecting, adjacent um, uh, fields, and sometimes you know, two insular among the, uh, each to its own. Um, and to just be in a room where we could um, sort of sloppily think across them, uh, a kind of humanities thinking, um, I think is enormously um, productive. Um, and among other things, what it does is sort of, um, uh, sort of jiggle you out of your customary frames. You know, so if you're a, a literary scholar, I guess, Meredith used the, the phrase earlier today, the literary target, right? If you're used to, foot, you know, sort of always look, shooting at the literary target, well, you know, in a room like this, you're going to have to, you know, sort of move your sights a little to one side, um, uh, sort of continuously. Um, and I think that's just so productive um, for all of us. Among other things, it, um, it, it, it should give us a sense of some of our missing objects, right? Mm -hmm. What we haven't seen. Um, and I think there are whole realms of vernacular textuality, for instance, that we haven't been able to see because we've been either in bibliography or in uh, media studies or in uh, American literary studies. Um, I think newspapers fall into this category or fell into this category for a long period um, and, and now have happily been seen um, and are, are productively being reseen um, in new ways th thanks to digital tools. Um, and my hope is that there are lots of other uh, objects that we haven't been able to see or haven't been able to see um, well enough um, to develop interesting questions about that. Um, uh, so, I mean, I with regard to tools, I think, I think we should be seeing ourselves as, in a sense, imagining what our tools are uh, and are for. Um, and that gets us to the space where we're talking about questions um, instead of all burrowing down into our little projects, as much as, you know, sort of le hearing about people's projects is the most edifying part. But when we talk them in common, um, I, love, I love that in a group like this that's quite so um, sort of diverse intellectually, we're looking at knowledge questions and what questions are interesting and important to ask. Um, uh, I was sort of riveted by the newspaper panel this afternoon, but I also wanted to register a terrific sound uh, panel this afternoon, um, which raises this question in a slightly different way about objects. Um, we are kind of all clocked in that there are digitized corpora of texts, right? And there's such exciting work, you know, to have at them. Um, what happens with stuff that is not a digitized corpus of text, right? What happens with sound? Um, how can we ask questions about digitized sound archives? What other kinds of archives? Um, there's a lot of interesting you know, sort of work being developed in image archives. Um, but what are the other options? How is, how is the uh, textual object one of these things that's blinding us um, so that we don't see other mm -hmm. objects? Right? What are the additional questions that we can get to if we just loosen off of that one for, for a couple of minutes? Um, and finally, I'll say this is sort of seconding something that um, uh, Ellen said um, that, that you know, we, could, we could cast this whole conversation in terms of the material. I think equally we could cast the whole conversation in terms of circulation. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, when I think about who I read uh, about circulation, it's Ellen and, and Meredith and lots of people in this room and, and, and Ryan and, and Elizabeth now. Um, so uh, uh, Will Straw, you know, just, just different ways to sort of theorize um, circulation just seems so, so potent and so powerful about the past but because of the present. Right, yeah, I would even say that uh, that's that great missing term in book history between uh, the protection side and the reception side. That funny middle ground, which seems to be in uh, sharing of both. Okay, um, boy, I I'm seconding things that uh, everybody has said already, but, but I'll just join in the seconding. Um, 
One, it soon became clear this morning that 2013-14 is just a different time in the history of the conversations between book historians and people in other fields. And uh, is uh, Paul still here? Uh, Molly's here, right? Um, oh, there you are. I mean, a couple of years ago at the AAS, when we ran a lot, there was a lovely conference thinking in part about digital resources for book history. And I just feel like the distance we've traveled between two years ago and now is, was it only one year ago? March of 2012. March of 2012. Okay, year, year and a half ago. Um, I, I just, this conversation to me at that moment wasn't uh, imaginable, so I'm just, I'm really thrilled uh, by the lack of defensiveness, by the awareness on all sides. Uh, if we put book history, bibliography, and DH, uh, they're so similar, but if we put them on, a po on poles of oldness and newness, uh, the fact that the, uh, there's a lot that we can learn from each other is um, deliciously um, uh, 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 present uh, uh, and uh, easily acknowledged. Um, I want to pick up on something uh, that um, Elizabeth was saying, particularly about thinking about 18th century and 19th century American uh, culture and literary culture in particular, uh, to think about colonialism and, and what, a, what a colonial becoming national print trades, what that particular historical scenario, how it resonates with our contemporary one. And I'll give a, I mean, I think there's a really nice marriage in a sense of our contemporary experience <coughs> of our shifting media ecology. Uh, there's a nice set of, an, sometimes misleading set of analogies, but an invitation to think them next to each other. Anyone who's used, um, ma um, Oh, those uh, uh, three volume history of American magazine magazines. It's, it's Moss, Mott. right? Mott. Uh, sorry, Frank, Frank, Frank Luther Mott. Um, they, at the back of those uh, volumes, you have these interesting charts of the um, uh, how long the durational run of 19th century um, print forms. And it, you know, you weep over them. One year, two years, post tenure at the Broadway Review. Not even one year. I mean, as an editor, uh, he was there a little bit longer. But that that temporality of, of cultural energy joining uh, together to do something great that's probably going to be forgotten. You know, we we do have now an analog of that in websites we loved that now look clunky or that went out of business. Right. That there are lots of that in our experience of pseudonymy. Um, is just so different now than it was 10 or 15 years ago. I think now we understand why someone might use a pseudonym, why, why the distance between the authorial name and the pseudonym might be something someone would want to preserve. I, I think lots of modes of access to the 19th century past have been paved by new by developments in new media. Um, but I also think it, it's, it would be very nice for us to use our period field expertise to think about um, a, about the contemporary moment, to think about what it means, what it meant for Americans, again, colonial, post-colonial, into early national um, uh, production, to think about nation. Um, uh, I'd like, I'd love us to see, uh, to see 19th century scholars as a group think with greater and greater specificity about Creole print culture, say, in uh, not just European print culture. How many of our critical theoretical paradigms come from a European text base? What would it mean to actually try to generate those critical theoretical paradigms from the materials, from the situatedness of uh, 19th century American printing? And now I've lost the end of my notes. Um, they'll come back in a minute. Uh, second, it's not a, it's not a um, new media conference without a media fail or two. Um, and then I'll find that I've run through all my all my points. Um, oh, materiality. Um, uh, in the reading group that uh, met about in and around materiality, I thought we had some really interesting discussions about the materiality of sound, about the complex materiality of print across different formats, different printing uh, techniques, different ways in which print is marked for a different set or class or gender of readers, but also the, the really complex work of describing the materiality of of digital circulation, um, you know, and I, I was talking about that uh, example of digit, and I'm sure that people talked about this yesterday, and I just wasn't here for it, but um, you know that these large corpora, which are digitized microfilm, microfilm that came from a 1950s Union catalog project, where a whole set of exclusions are built into the collection, which then somehow seems so large as to be comprehensive. So it's a substitute for comprehensiveness. And what would it mean to mark, uh, did, to find ways of marking, or just having a, practicing the narrative description of the layered materiality of uh, digital media? Um, uh, 
Lisa and I taught a summer seminar at the Antiquarian Society years ago uh, on book history and media history, and we ended up taking a field trip to EBSCO. Um, and part of the aim of that was to try to experience the, not to just think about digitality as immaterial, to experience what it's meant to walk through a server farm um, and to talk to them about the extra ring of elect electrical infrastructure they put around the place uh, and to note the du duplications of the servers and the fact that they were planning to, they were worried about hurricanes hitting Ipswich and they were going to build a duplicate of their duplicative server farm in Texas. I mean, just, just some, you know, self-conscious thinking about the materiality of digitality and as a way if only to get back to think about the complex materiality of 19th century um, print. Oh, and my, the last thing I'm very increasingly interested in finding ways to describe uh, is the multimedia nature of 19th century, I mean, I think the, of 19th century print or print, understand, people who worked in and around print were working in uh, environments of, of uh, oratorical delivery and performance and handwritten circulation and printed circulation of various kinds uh, and operatic um, and theatrical production. I think we flattened out print uh, to be uh, less internally differentiated than it was and part of our experience of the multimedia bells and whistles of our contemporary moment can encourage us to go back uh, and try to think through the 19th century in a multimedia form. But this is all, I would just echo just tremendous excitement um, at where we are right now. Um, this, this conference has seemed to me like a, a huge and welcome advance. Mm -hmm. Shall we throw it open, or do we want to, shall we converse ourselves, or I think we're I'm happy to throw it open. Yeah. Yeah. People yeah, yeah. want to say things. So. You could just poo poo. Yeah. <laughs> you can say it. Add things, poo poo. Yeah. One of the take homes for me uh, was that I, I'm beginning to hear uh, the memes or the mimes crossing <laughs> the bridge backward. Mm. And uh, a perfect example is the viral 19th century newspaper. Uh, in other words, that's a, an extraction out of current. Um, what we call media specific uh, terminology is taken to something that would not have been there. So mm -hmm. then I'm asking, can we get to the middle of the bridge and watch the two-way traffic? And to fill that out, I would offer that one of the ways is to develop a whole glossary of these uh, mediating terms. I would suggest that something like feral text uh, <laughs> might be the uh, actual approach to it, uh, a halfway between wild and domestic on the one hand, but also connoting something quite contemporary. Uh, the species that are going feral and our own feral behaviors in modern historic settings. So I'm, I'm very uh, excited to hear these mimes now, instead of being all extracted out of legacy, now we're coming from the digital legacy backward. Well, I would just like to add something on that idea of back formations, because I think that's fed a lot of, uh, well, the, 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 the new awareness that we have through using digital media, d using, using social media, has brought us to a whole new perspective on 19th century uh, ways of networking, as we saw this, after, uh, this, uh, this morning with that, you know, all of those brilliant I investigations into networks. Uh, when we think now about, say, clipping services uh, from the late 19th century, we see another way of disaggregating news, the newspaper, sending it out into different piles. We see, can see the, you know, utopian excite, the excitement about this utopian possibility that you could get a pile of information on exactly what you wanted delivered to your doorstep twice a week, even in a remote location in, in rural America that, you know, and it's so par so similar, of course, to the excitement about the web and, and, and its resources and even our excitement now here 
about what we can do with this new technology. But um, I don't think we, and, and if we were look, had been looking at that, at clipping services 15 years ago, we wouldn't have noticed anything about yeah. like that. We wouldn't have noticed the possibility of networking through it. We also wouldn't have noticed that um, the the clipping services commercialize something that had been non-commercial of simply passing clippings back and forth, disaggregating the paper on your own in a non-commercial space, and 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 shifting those pieces around. So we also so as we have new new we have our senses sharpened in us, and you know we have our, our academic knives out in a new way uh, to see all of these connections. Or and or scissors. <laughs> well, they actually used knives in the clipping <laughs> services. Um, so go from the home scissors to the clipping to the commercial knives, and you know when we can do that. Now maybe it's too neat a parallel, mm -hmm. so we have to start questioning it after you know once we've set that up, uh, because it doesn't. Qu there are ways that those things don't really fit. They are rather different, but but bringing those parts together, I think, gives us. You know, whole new fields to look at. I mean, who looked at clipping services before? Why bother? It didn't really yeah. register as anything in particular. You would see, you you know, you'd be going through something in an archive and you'd see the blue pencil marks and you'd figure that's where it came from, but so what? But now that we have a, uh, a different view of information and its movement, or we have a different view of newspapers and their importance because we can just get at so many of them, right. then we're, we're looking at... at uh, you know, then, then we, we do want to cross the bridge and we want to hang out on that bridge and, and look back and forth and, and, uh, and back formations may not be exactly what, what has been most honored in scholarship, but on the other hand, it's awfully useful. It's teaching us something. Well, I just want to add one more layer um, and the potential parallel there is that clipping services are intended to be, right, a sort of... Um, a standardized depersonalized as opposed to something like the scrapbook that the individual <coughs> presumably read the scrap then decided to insert it and that the clipping services whether that's an author looking for every review of, of their book or whatever um, is let's cast the white net and get all this stuff back and I can't help but think about the parallel with sort of close reading and distant reading right and um, what that says, right? What does it mean to read the clip before sort of putting it into the matrix or into the sort of um, uh, that web of connection or building the web and then trying to read into it, right? And those seem to be two different strategies. One's individuated and personalized or potentially in a different way. Right, but and at the same time, they're also, there's a kind of industrial scale of the clipping service, both of the you know room full of women clipping, marking and clipping, and also, um, and also just the the size of the packet you could produce from drawing from many different papers, and I think that parallel to projects like the um, what's your wonderful project called again? Viral text. The viral text project, where you're scan you know working through so many different papers, to you know with a giant mass of scissors clip out all of those. Uh, the, the, the duplicates that they actually would have disliked seeing in their packet, by but the way. I wanted to emphasize that there's an aesthetic dimension to all of this, which I wouldn't want to lose, that I think we now have a, both a tolerance for and a, maybe an appreciation of miscellaneousness. Um, that, right, I mean, that I think aesthetic, aesthetic, our tastes in news may have changed, or our mm. taste, our, our ability to appreciate um, uh, the eclecticism of, of 1840s, 50s, um, uh, literary genres. It's, it can be very, if you know that some or, or genres that happened prior to uh, the novel taking over, or you know the assumption of certain modes of reading. I do think it's not only worthwhile talking about the social and cultural shifts, but being attentive to the aesthetic qualities um, that get attached to them. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask a question about these conversations of a bridge and clipping services with respect to the public and the larger public understanding, because we're all scholars and academics. And, and the thing that came to my mind was Paul Atle, who is a Belgian documentalist at the beginning of the 20th century. And for instance, I argue that uh, his work and other people were antecedents to Wikipedia. And 
uh, Paul Otley was actually a, an article about a scholar of Otley was you know, prominently featured in the New York Times like five years ago. So I was just wondering if I were to generalize this, since everything digital is sort of hot, and since digital humanities has the word digital in it, and since it makes these relationships between the past and the present, maybe even the future salient, um, it seems to do so beyond the academic scholarly world. And do, does anyone have any thoughts about that? To what extent is this understanding and insight that we might be gain, gaining uh, contribute to a larger discourse popular? Um, well, maybe I can say something about that. I'm not sure I can hit both sides of your of your of your comment, but I was thinking that if we're going to add to um, virality, if I can make up a noun, mm -hmm. and um, the aesthetics of miscellany, right, as two of these points or or things to look at at the on the bridge, right. Another one relevant to your question would be. Um, uh, um, uh, I guess it came up yesterday in terms of permanence and ephemerality, mm. um, but it but it rises um, to consciousness. I think in popular consciousness around um, Wikipedia, with regard to um, the uh, the way in which w w Wikipedia sort of just defines itself as a living document, mm. right? The forever shape shifting organization of all knowledge, um, uh, and the forever shiftingness is the part I'm emphasizing, <coughs> whereas the Otley look would focus on the organization of all knowledge. Um, and I think that's another way to, to maybe ask questions about the, the 19th century, too, is to what extent do any one of these newspapers or a collection of newspapers or a cluster of newspapers or the work of a single editor who moves from paper to paper, um, uh, to what extent does it represent uh, a way of seeing a fluctuating mass? I mean, are we somehow misperceiving 19th century texts because we find them in the archive as solid, stable artifacts, right? Is there a way in which the 19th century Two had available um, to itself uh, a sense of the living um, document. That's kind mm. of a riff off. Oh, sorry, rather than answer. Mm. That does speak to one. Oh, go ahead. Well, I I was going to add another you know another term that we haven't talked much about, but and this is this is not um, any uh, offering any um, grand new insight, but um, I would just underscore the absence of the term author from our mm. conversations, mm. Um, particularly. You know, those of us trained in literary studies, um, for for early Americanists, this is a particularly welcome term since we never had any authors anyway. <laughs> so, you know, when people say, who do, you, "Who do you work on?" and you say, "You know, Susanna Rosen," and people just look puzzled. So the um, we never had any good answers to that question, or not answers that seem to count. So um, it's really nice to not have to um, frame everything in terms of the author. But there is a really Thoroughgoing critique of um, of the uh, uh, of authorship going on um, in I think both in um, embedded in all of the notions that that are here about writing with scissors, for instance, um, uh, principles of assemblage, um, uh, the question of um, uh, of the multiple moments of production that are involved, uh, whether those are. Um, printing or circulation or reception and so forth. I mean, the, a kind of um, Darton-esque um, notion. But I think the more that we think about the way that meaning is created from um, uh, texts or ideas being um, embedded, assembled, placed next to each other, circulated among communities, the more um, those terms gain meaning and the, the less this kind of fiction of the author organizes what counts as knowledge and literature and meaning for us. And so I think it's just worth underscoring that um, because of the way in which that has so dominated literary studies for so many years. I wanted to go in a different, oh, you want to head, I, I want to go in a different to direction. I just respond yeah. to, to that, to your question in another direction, which I think was something you were getting at, which is digital humanities as public humanities. Is that right. part of what you were at after? I mean, that we were just talking about that in the, in the work group I was in earlier. And, and that they're, because people are putting out uh, websites, putting out public, publicly available scholarship, uh, but not in scholarly form, that is something that, that is accessible, p potentially accessible and attractive to a larger public in a way that most of our scholarly work is not. Um, and that, uh, that came up, and Ed, Ed Whitley was talking about that in relation to the vaulted FAP site, which r gets a huge number of hits, 
from people who might just be looking for their ancestors and come across that in their genealogical searches and then get engaged in the website in, in some other fashion. So I think there's, you know, it's sort of like when you list something on eBay, you have to list it according to all the possible keywords that you could imagine somebody finding it by so that it, you hit, even if you can't imagine why they would be buying it, you hit all the possible communities. And we might want to think about our projects in that way. Are they ex both accessible to and attractive to a variety of uses that we can't anticipate and are not our intended uses? I don't mean that we can't anticipate. We should try to anticipate. We should look for as a way of, again, connect, be pulling in more, more as clickbait, shall we say. <laughs> I was going to go in a slightly, go back to my poignancy of the Frank Luther Mont charts, um, because one of the themes that I find very interesting is the productivity of failure, the inevitability and the productivity of failure in, in uh, digital humanities projects. Uh, that I mean, one of the downsides of the seemingly infinitely extensible digital project um, is it never comes to a cor uh, form of completion. I mean, that's the upside of Wikipedia, that it feels like a living document that's never completed, but the codex form gives us a figure for a completion, and anyone who's stood for tenure understands what that figure means. Uh, and so I, I do think that some of the richness of the talk back and forth between um, book history, literary history, and digital projects, it would be very nice if we could like scientists, understand that failed experiments produce knowledge, um, right? Um, and find ways to claim, to acknowledge that a, a, a project that doesn't go on forever, the, uh, an archive that gets closed and somehow looks antiquated, or uh, an experiment that doesn't pan out the way that you think it does. I mean, maybe we turn that into an article, right? Um, but but that I, you know, I, I think these rich collaborations should we should find ways of changing our rhetoric about success and failure. Um, uh, I mean, uh, it would be lovely if a clickbait public humanities project, if all of our projects in their free and openness meant that they circulated far and wide, but you know, they may not and they're probably still worth doing. Um, mm -hmm. For what you know, Elizabeth was saying about getting down to the brass tacks of trying to understand um, what our objects are. to add a little anecdote to that in terms of music that you know we do have this in in electronic music this whole rhetoric of the aesthetics of failure and yeah. how that aesthetic has been ins inscribed in so many um, musical works in terms of people you know drawing on the noise elements of technologies or specifically using digital glitches as part of the artistic material so mm. just a little We should find ways of alluding to or remediating each other's digital projects. Well, I think we saw a wonderful example of that was yesterday. I mean, that Augusta presented a project that somebody else pointed out had a kind of, that was slightly off in its assumption about how, how Google Images worked. And we all learned something from, or many of us learned something, from, <laughs> from her being willing to share that in public and to learn in public so mm -hmm. that that, that when that happens too, it's not an occasion of shame, it's an occasion of, wow, let's all learn together and think about how, how then productively could we use uh, a series of, uh, a chronological series of Google searches, uh, of screenshots of these searches and what, mm. what to do with them. So, um, yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, panelists, and, and thank you, everyone. This has been really wonderful. And I perhaps spent a few too many years recently in administrative position, so I constantly return to thinking about institutional frames for the mm. work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, in my uh, large research institution, um, despite prominent members of our, my department of faculty calling for um, revisions of the book for tenure model or mm. for more collaborative kinds of publication, but one of the biggest impediments to getting digital work recognized in tenure evaluations or promotion evaluations within our particular English department has to do with the fact that m many of these projects by necessity are multiply authored or multiply produced. <coughs> and that's the best thing about the work that I think we're all doing is how collaborative it is, both in terms of the content of what we're studying, but in the way that it's produced. Uh, I know that I've benefited enormously over the years of doing my own project 
by comments from many of the people in this room and seeing different versions of it, that's always a collaborative act uh, in turn. And so um, I, I'm, I'm, my, my broader question has to do with how, um, other than you know, letters issued from the MLA office that get ignored by most <laughs> research departments, or, um, or, or other, how best to educate our colleagues about the value of this kind of collaborative work, the amount of time and resources that it takes, not just in terms of the technological infrastructure, but also in terms of the, um, the, 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 the ways in which the nature of those kinds of collaborations is going to change um, depending on people's <coughs> institutional access, their institutional position, um, if you are co-authoring or co-producing something with someone who is not on the same administrative or institutional track that you might be, um, how, how can we uh, talk to, and I say this as a, someone who's DH curious and not a <laughs> practitioner, I follow the conversations very closely, although I, I don't have the tools yet um, to, to produce them myself, um, and, but the, the conversion questions, mm. um, the translation questions are one that I'm, I'm, I'm really mindful of, and I'm wondering if anyone in the room has ideas about how to um, make that work more legible to those who are interested in it but not practitioners versus the, to those like, um, I'm, I'm seeing this all the more visibly and a little sh shaken by it. Um, my department has to vacate our building for a two to four year building renovation um, and into very tiny temporary offices and most of my colleagues have taken this opportunity to purge their libraries. Um, <laughs> Many have sold them to local bookstores, or not local, we don't have any local ones, to bookstores in Harrisburg. Um, and many are filling our hallways with gigantic recycling carts in which they're throwing out their books, so they're recycling them, uh, including you know, distinguished historians of the book, um, not sharing them necessarily. I mean, they're open for dumpster diving, which we've all been doing. Um, but it, uh, the, 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 thinking about the way the circulation of what's disposable and what's not disposable, what has a kind of permanence, is even all the more poignant. Mm. Everyone's thrown away their entire journal's collections mm. because that is not something that we can bring home with us. Um, so th this is a, it, it has a kind of effective trigger for me, especially mm. as you might be here. Yes, Esther, your, your initial comment makes me realize that the authorship question, which yeah. we're not, has been avoided in all of their, our research, uh, sort of rears its head in the evaluation of that research. research. Absolutely, uh, absolutely, and and the question of the of the um, the monograph is having a kind of closure and finitude mm. to it that the that the DH project doesn't. That, yeah. All of those the the the, the sort of um, author function, the closure function, the monograph, the notion of agency, all, all of those feed into this idea of performance and tenure within the academy. So I think they are very much linked. I think just one, one th uh, comment to that point is that I think that if we do have any hope of institutional change um, in the ways that you're thinking about, it, it, it is precisely to forward um, interesting, important intellectual inquiries um, and not get trapped in a sort of inter-DH conversation or an inter-anything conversation, but continue to make these intersecting and overlapping sub-disciplines talk to one another um, so that we're heard outside of, you know, the, the little walls in which we work. I mean, it's, you know, education, long, slow way to change the world, but, uh, <laughs> but, but that's why we're in it, you know. The other thing that I would say is that if, if, if at the institutional level, on the one hand, there's the, there is a sense of um, that digital humanities is hot. We want digital humanities. We, this is something we need, we want, we know that it's important. Um, and then there's also uh, the promise of, particularly of grant funding as associated with the digital humanities that, um, that makes deans and department chairs excited. So, so one question is to, one, one um, thing to think about is how to leverage that institutional desire towards the um, uh, supporting the scholars who do that at the tenure moment, right? Mm. So sort of constantly drawing the line between those things and making that line visible. So you can't have, uh, uh, if you want a digital scholar, you can't have somebody who does this work and then turn them down for um, tenure. Um, that there's actually a connection between wanting it and having to, you know, give the person who does that work some kind of institutional security. Mm -hmm. So I think all of the moments when the institution um, 
uh, gets excited about digital humanities, those are the time to continue to draw attention to this is the way that this work um, takes institutional shape, these are the people who are doing this labor, this is what this labor looks like in terms of time and engagement, and this is what it looks like in terms of value to the institution. So the more that that becomes visible, um, again, a slow process, that isn't no kind of magic bullet, but that's the story that needs to be produced. I think that there's another side to that that's often less um, well articulated, that in the same way that DH has a certain appeal or cachet because of potential grant funding, the kind of stemminess and the rest of that, um, in a lot of different uh, university and college contexts, media studies also has a kind of similar appeal because of enrollments. Um, because it's getting undergraduate students uh, where the money is made in seats. Um, and they are in the seats because they want to learn about virality um, and it's the aesthetics of miscellany and living documents. And they're, they're hungry for it and, and they are also, you know, sort of ripe to, for a little historical bait and switch. Um, so, you know, oh, I you think that contemporary virality. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I really think you know we need to sort of forward that too as another successful strategy uh, for changing the world. Mm -hmm. Great. There you go. As the season from working studio, I'm returning to academia from a long career in the world, and so I think a little differently than a lot of scholars do. Still, um, you're talking about. I think you're absolutely smack on target of saying if you bring in grant money, grant money is there for uh, anything that's digital or STEM. Uh, they don't want corporations and funders to hear about humanities, humanities. But as soon as they think it, it has something to do with, with computers, they love it. Um, but it's also persuading your audience, your internal audience, which are your administrators and your deans. And so I'm wondering if, just like there's the MLA, that will have panels and, 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 and things. If there are associations of academic administrators that you can get speakers for panels at or somehow communicate with to explain that you have to have that collaboration is important uh, in humanities as well as in the sciences because it brings in money today. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And I was also thinking, too, about the question of the um, slow temporal uh, development of digital projects and uh, the importance of benchmarking. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because, you know, uh, those people who spend a decade writing biographies know uh, that you cannot get promoted because you've spent a decade doing a project that takes a decade. Uh, uh, and, and if you've got a digital project that's it's hard to get promoted if, if you don't have some concrete, evaluatable benchmark that's appropriate for a year three or a year five, if the tenure promotion is keyed to those um, smaller durational um, spans, are th is there are, are there groups of um, humanities de SAS deans, arts and sciences yeah. deans that get actually, together? Yeah, no, there are. There are. Yeah. There. they have picnics. Yeah, <laughs> you got to get into the picnic. Yeah, Chris. Um, there was actually uh, it wasn't a humanities group, but a group of Northeast deans and provosts recently had a panel that was focused on what tenure processes for DH practitioners might actually look like. And I found out about it because my provost emailed me and another person who's working on our college's uh, DH initiative and said, "Well, we this is really really interesting. We should sit down and talk about this." Sometime I got the whole uh, PowerPoint slideshow sent to me. I was so huh. it clearly struck a, a chord with my provost. So there, there is who, who's a, a neuroscientist. So you know that there, there's something that is getting traction out there. So what it amounts to yet, I'm not sure. But but there is something. That's that's something that you know PACLS should be playing leadership over. Right. Yeah. Brian. Yeah. I think it's just worth tossing into the conversation here that. Uh, administrative ideas about the amount of money that's available for DH work don't <laughs> in any way, shape, or form line up with the actual amount of money that's available exactly, for DH yeah. work. Um, I mean, take this with a grain of salt as someone who's gotten a grant for a DH project, but, um, you know, Brett Bobley, who's the director of the Office of Digital Humanities at the NEH, likes to point out that the ODH is by and large the tiniest division of the ODH. I mean, it's a sliver. Of the NEH. Of the NEH, yeah. sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, of the NEH. I mean, he likes to point out that it's their funding is a tiny sliver of the total amount of money that the NEH gives away. And of course, there are other parts of the NEH that do give money to digital projects, but mm. it's just worth saying that administrators sort of see dollar signs in DH, and the 
some DH project get these really big grants, yeah. but it's not a cash cow by any means. That strikes me altogether that the importance of a conference like this, where digital methods and you know, conventional academic period field study are being articulated together where the meaningfulness of these new methods for changing our questions, right, and the usefulness of the traditional humanities to digital projects is, is very much in the forefront of this conference. I mean, for me, that's what was so exciting about it. Um, yeah, John? Um, I want to say also in the kind of thinking about institutional politics, maybe to echo Elizabeth a little bit, that the tack that we take might not always be, um, hey, we're just like this, or like, mm. hey, like we are now in the STEM, but we're recognizable as this, but rather to figure out a way to get larger institutional structures to see that these questions have been here all along. Mm. Um, you know, there, there's a way in which I think maybe three, four, or five years ago, some of us were saying, oh, look, it's kind of like this, you know, it's kind of like this Facebook thing, right? <laughs> um, whereas now I think we're at a point where we're saying, hey, wait a second, maybe some things that were recognizable as media events in the 20th century were exceptions to longer patterns mm -hmm. that we are now able to see across the 18th, 19th century, early 20th century, whatever. Um, but, you know, instead of just saying, hey, look, we can be like right. computer science. Um, but then, like, the questions that are now in, that are now legible under this sign have been with us you know, for a while, and, and we're very we and we're very good at thinking about yeah. them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chris, I think one thing that's really struck me about this uh, conference is how much that the kind of, as we're talking about the, these conversations that need to happen, the communities that need to get built, how important it is that uh, the in-person nature of what uh, we're doing, you know, the, the fact that these conversations have happened um, face to face. Uh, I'm thinking of the, the moment with uh, uh, Joseph and Augusta yesterday. I think that would have been very, very difficult to handle if it was not face to face in, in as productive a way as it was. A lot of the back and forth and Q and A as people have built on each other's ideas. Um, you know, that one of the interesting things for me at this conference is how kind of startling the the Twitter. Uh, dimension has been because you know there are plenty of people who tweet at conferences now, but at this point, it just, because this is so intimate, people are here are very proficient at working with Twitter, but there's just kind of a shock. Oh, you're you. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're, you're that one. Okay, and, and so the the, the sense that uh, the Twitter is adding to the conversation certainly, but it almost becomes unnecessary or distracting at a certain point because the in-person is so powerful um, that we're, we're crossing these fields with and without that kind of mediation. Ryan, do you have an, oh, more, more talk. Just yeah. sort of one more thing to toss in too. I mean, well, the, the sort of evaluation and assessment is sort of playing out and we're sort of figuring out how we can sort of validate all of this work that's so exciting and inspiring and flashy and sparkly. Um, but I mean, there's also some real labor concerns, right? Mm -hmm. That For a lot of us, I think we really enjoy this and believe in the value of it, but are also doing it outside of our regular working hours. Um, and that that's, I mean, that's something that people have talked about across the sort of broader digital culture, right? The sort of digital yeah. labor is getting treated as invisible and therefore free and marginalized. Um, it's not just sort of out there, but I mean, I think it's something that's that's operating fairly dynamically with a lot of us. Um, so I just want to sort of make sure that we, we sort of keep the labor issue that's, of course, across the entire academy, but I think especially true with these sorts of conversations. Somebody else had a hand. I was interested in, from the conference organizers, what they imagined our next steps could or should be. It may be too early yeah. to, to shift to that question, but I'm very interested in it. Well, well I mean, actually, I was going to sort of ask you that question. Um, oh. <laughs> just to say, my, my idea for the last question that I would ask would be, I, mean, I think I've heard a lot of conversation from people who came in from the DH side, from the American Lit side, uh, from somewhere in between, about how uh, generative this gathering has been. And so, yeah, my real question is, we're all going to leave and go back to our DH conferences and our American literature conferences and whatever else. Uh, how can we continue to facilitate these kinds of engagements 
um, either with this group or to try and sort of extend these kinds of conversations? Uh, I mean, what are the venues? Are they, yeah. Is it more gatherings like this, or are there other things that we can and should be doing to advance this kind of conversation? One thought that came up over lunch, which only attack, attacks a little tiny bit of this, uh, is to imagine at the uh, C19, at the Period Field Conference, to have what we were talking about at lunch as a kind of uh, radical archives caucus. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I was gravitating towards archives in part because it split the difference between print and digital, where of course we use digital tools to get to our print archives, right? Um, and our digital archives are full of remediated print. I mean, at some point, making the distinction seems like a distinction, you know, uh, we, to come up with a term that wouldn't try to split the difference between um, print and digital. That certainly seems like something we might do. Uh, the C19 as a conference only meets at once every other year, um, but it might be worth um, I think I may have volunteered to contact the organizers uh, about, uh, I think I did find yeah, myself I, I volunteering. Heard, heard you heard me right. volunteering. <laughs> I, do this, I do this, it's a mistake, it somehow happens. Uh, but to see whether there is space for those of us who will be at C19 to meet and to think uh, in, in that space. Uh, and that seems a worthwhile one, but obviously not one of many uh, such responses. Yeah, Augusta. One thing that came out of our little working group conversation, I'm gonna modify it slightly, um, just to sort of respond to the call here, was this notion that we might interview one another and make hmm. podcasts. Ooh. And I just, like, I love the liveness of the interview. I love the not reading it mm -hmm. part of it. Um, and I love the sort of, like, intensity that I feel these last two days has been so energizing as we really engage one another in a kind of one-on-one, -on -one, even in a group formation. So I'm wondering about maybe <laughs> developing some kind of roving interview, one another podcast kind of thing that we could put up into a website <laughs> or something. Because I just think we're all each these incredible resources, but we're better resources when we talk to each other. <laughs> and to sort of get that leverage where are you, Mike? I said it again. But that, <laughs> um, that kind of thing to like really energize and motivate additional conversations. So it could even be people if choose. I'd like to interview you, Lisa. You know, and so forth. I mean, that kind of. I mean, I'm just saying. Because I've been honoring her all day. I've been her, so I'm just gonna keep doing it. But you know, that could be a kind of nice way to keep the conversation going, to invigorate thinking in the field do this kind of cross-pollination with a relatively small pay-in mm. as far as time investment. Um, so, right. yeah. Yeah, oh, sorry. Two, two things to throw out. So I talked to the Rare Book School this morning, and if you guys have enjoyed this and you would like to meet again, mm. um, I can apply to get funding for that to happen. Mm -hmm. I think that that would be really generative to continue the conversation and also um, we don't have anyone really from the West Coast, yeah. so I think there's a lot of voices that should be brought in, and so if you also have abilities to match institutional funding, mm -hmm. if you could let me know, that'd be really helpful. Also, in terms of the podcast idea, I don't know about the new lab, but my website, US History Scene, our whole point is to help scholars connect the general public. It's completely free. If you have a project, just send it to me, and I'll put it up. You retain all of your rights, um, so I'd be happy to host that and help you send that out. Augusta asks. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. But we will be sending out feedback about this conference, so if you guys can give us that information, that'd be really helpful in us trying to then go get the money to Got to bring this back. Laura had a, had an idea, and then Ed. Well, it was really a question. Um, I didn't have a sense from uh, the projects I heard about, and of course we didn't all hear about all of them because of some of the concurrent sessions, but whether there's been any practice of having kind of a, an advisory uh, board or, or something for any of these projects, um, however informal. So perhaps not as formal as, say, a scholarly journal might have or something like that, but whether there's ways that some of us could take on roles where we just, you know, occasionally try something out and see how it works and see how it fits, you know, with what we do or whether there's these kind of different tiers of, of engagement people might be able to have, whether or not they have a whole DH team operating at their institution or, or whatever. That might be a way also of kind of extending a sense of community or expertise. Easily written, in, easily written into a grant, too. Mm. Where, where, yeah. where's, where's my 
I like your suggestion on Twitter. You should, you should, you should make it for the whole Sorry, what was that? What was the suggestion? Can you share it with Features the class? Well, I'm, asking, I'm asking her to suggest it. Yeah. Well, I think the Babel working group, I like the Babel working group mm, as a the, model. They're medievalists, but they run a um, publishing imprint. Um, they do, they, they utilize social media um, really uh, in really like productive, fun, interesting ways. They advocate for their work, which I think that's a sort of pet concern of mine that has been kind of a subtext. So you know, I think that's a difference between digital humanities and traditional humanities. The digital humanities perceives a need to advocate for work that traditional humanities doesn't. And I think that, um, anyway, so, uh, and in terms of a kind of, of a working group that persists outside of the, these physical events, I, you know, I, 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 think that, I think that would be a great. So the thing to do then might be to plan both phys physical and virtual, uh, you know, uh, conversations to sort of start a next step and maybe find a, like an internet home base uh, or, a, you know, an online space to begin. Ed wanted to jump in. Hybrid group too, people doing digital stuff. Yeah, doing yeah, yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah. And um, <coughs> produ yeah, producing. I mean, producing like you know medieval scholarship, uh, publishing hybrid, uh, you know, uh, uh, texts. You know, uh, memoir. You know, uh, creative texts, and also like just being kind of funny and fun on the internet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ed wanted to say something, yeah. Yeah, just to, to volunteer a, um, a space, and I'll say it again, Paul's earshot, so he can correct me if it drops in, if needed. <laughs> <laughs> I just recently took over as the editor of the web library section of Commonplace. Mm -hmm. And you know, at, the, at the board meeting a couple weeks ago at the, uh, for Commonplace, we think about ways that we can reimagine that. But it, 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 traditionally, it's just been, every time there's a new issue, we review a website. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. It shouldn't be that slow aggregation of one website. Um, but there may be other ways that we can reimagine that web library space on some place. We wait and see what we're talking about. There's a way to showcase DH projects yeah. through in the process and either feedback on there's, there's a model of this that um, early Americanists Duncan Faraday and Ed White have a, a project they call Just Teach One, where they are making their own digital editions of um, out of print early American oh, texts and mm -hmm. asking a bunch of people to teach them and write up their experiences teaching them. Mm -hmm. and I think a similar kind of model could be really great for gay projects mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Just each one says about how That makes me think of um, a related point, which is that um, I think that in all of the uh, Digital, digital projects that we're doing that keeping in mind the question of how people are actually using them and and especially in the classroom is is really an important component of their possible vitality or lack thereof so one um, so one version of sharing those projects is also uh, letting people know how they might uh, teach with them mm -hmm. or use them in, in their in the classroom as well yeah, we were talking at lunch about the pleasures and frustrations of using Omeka for teaching. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, I would, love to, I would love to be in a conversation with more people about, about that and how I might do a better job of teaching Dublin Core metadata next time I try mm -hmm. it. Um, but, right, I mean, that's, and actually having some examples or, or with a group of us agreeing, it, many of us teach the American Literature Survey or, or maybe there's just one kind of course we can do a version of just teach one, right? Just just use one database. Or um, uh, one of the great advantages to doing that actually is you can have students with digital work that's in the public domain. You can have students from different universities be, work with each other. I co-taught uh, a class that had we had the same syllabus and we both had WordPress sites. And one of our exercises was to have students read uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. It was a media literature and media class. Read Uncle Tom's Cabin through the digital facsimiles of the installments and then write about it. And it was really quite something for my students to get on a public web. I mean, it seems like such a simple thing, but so much of the horizon of their intellectual life is their university, as if they never imagined that undergraduates all over the world are at teach in the same classes, um, uh, and that they could read each other's blog postings. It was surprisingly rich. Yeah. Oh, I'm just, it just, those annotation programs 
we do those across mm -hmm. campuses mm -hmm. across the country where you have everyone commenting from different classes, classes? On it's great Emerson text and how the students get this exposure to the different grades of education at different kinds of institutions. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal. Yeah. You can see those threads. Anyway. There's a, um, just a little old media, new media um, teaching moment. Um, I had a class in 18th century uh, literature and, um, and gender, and I was going to have the students use Omeka to make a commonplace book, hmm. and then I decided that was too difficult and jumped ship to Pinterest. Mm. And so they made commonplace books on Pinterest, and they were so good. <laughs> and, yeah. and the students totally loved doing it. Wow. So, so and, the, and of course, this principle of assemblage that is what Pinterest is, and also what the commonplace book is, mm -hmm. was, was just intersected in this really generative and, and, and very fun way. I just want to say, also thinking about taking these projects forward, um, thinking about who our students or our collaborators are, I don't think necessarily has to be at our home institution, yes. where we might be. Um, last year I did a project with a grad school colleague of mine, who's now at Rice. Her, her students were doing an American Lit course, and they were reading uh, the Marvel font. And I had graduate students in an information architecture course. What do you do for a final project? She had her students imagine what a digital edition of two chapters of the Marvel font mm -hmm. would look like, um, because they're particularly spatially and visually oriented. And they wrote up these ideas, and, mm. and my students tried to make that happen. Wow. Uh, to, you know, different levels of success, but nonetheless. Um, Productive failure. It's okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, 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 like, you know, I frequently have students who are looking for projects to do um, who don't necessarily have, this is this content discipline, mm. form discipline thing I was talking about yesterday, so who want to learn how to use Omeka, who want practice in, in Drupal, um, but who, you know, don't necessarily in the two years that are on campus get get, you know, dug into a DH project on campus mm. one place or another. So I, it, maybe we ought to think about developing a kind of hub for, you know, prod projects. Like, you know, I'm looking for someone who can do this. And we, we, we don't need to develop the hub, we just need to use DH comments. Okay, I'm sorry. Mm. <laughs> right. Which is, which is right. one of my projects. Um, <laughs> And actually, I mean, it's worth saying, actually, one of the goals, DH Commons is about to launch as a journal as well. Oh, great. And we're, I'm using journal of quotations because actually the whole point of DH Commons, the journal, is going to be to facilitate a kind of benchmarking for mid-stage hmm. DH projects. Wow, so great. So peer review of projects that are not done, but that have reached a critical milestone where they can uh, articulate the interventions they've made. Um, so that's that's coming because I, I think there's a sense uh, you're exactly right the, the field desperately needs that yeah. for people who are going up for tenure to have something to point to and say this has been peer-reviewed uh, you know these are the uh, mm -hmm. contributions to the field that the, scholar, the scholars in that field have articulated for that it's project. already made even though it's yes. not or it's on the horizon to make yeah right exactly mm -hmm. um, and, and but the original idea DH Commons was a place to register your projects and to list the kinds of help that you would be willing mm -hmm. that you either need or that you want and so some of those kinds of help can be like beta testing, classroom mm. uh, experiments, things like that. Um, but you know, letting people know it's out there proves to be far more difficult than anyone would have ever anticipated. Yeah. Can, can I ask, I, I don't want to put anyone in particular on the spot, but I'm really also interested in how this universe of possibility looks for graduate students. Um, right, because I don't. I'm not looking at anyone in particular. Uh, uh, you know, you are often, not always, more tech savvy. I don't. Uh, it's not always true. Uh, you've got a horizon of a number of years at a place, which is just enough to get dig, dug in a little bit to a DH project. But then you have to think about your own portability. Is there anything that? And you're getting like a mountains of conflicting advice from every quarter. <laughs> yeah, do it. Do it in order to get a job. If you do it, you'll never get a job. You know that kind of. You know. So you know, I guess it's a really open question for everyone to think about. What would it be like to nurture this kind of work amongst grad students and to think about grad students' particular needs? Um, yeah, I guess so. Uh, I did a project with my graduate students that built an Emerson site. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I guess I would suggest that working in a group of students, so students have one leg in the project, but then another leg free to continue on mm -hmm. with what they're doing. Because I do think it's a lot to ask a graduate student at any institution regardless 
to invest 100% full heartedly in some in, a, in a something like that. And then the other thing is, is that when you do something like that, then you get credentials in collaboration and project development and other kinds of things that are not strictly speaking the academic tenure track job. So that, that's mm -hmm. just my opinion in, in my experience. Yes. I'll, I'll speak about my experience. I finished my PhD exams on Monday. <laughs> and then uh, yesterday afternoon presented about a website project that I'm collaborating with about 20 other people on, yeah. um, which overlapped in no particular way at all with the PhD exams that I just yeah. took. Um, and I mean, something that I've always tried to sort of ask folks who are further along in the field of DH, say, what you write your dissertation on? And they'll say 18th century French literature, mm. or, you know, history of the Caribbean. And there doesn't really seem to have been a, a generation of PhD students who have done hybrid dissertations. I mean, I know that mm -hmm. there are some. Um, but really, I mean, you know, say to a, a, a university that wants to hire you, please, please take me on, give me a tenure track job. But they're not always sure that they're <coughs> going to be able to tenure, tenure you, you know, a number of years. And so it's a real sort of risk that you have to establish yourself as a credible historian or a literary historian, but also being able to, to sort of work all the sort of magic with all the digital stuff. Um, and you, I mean, at least in my own experience, I have this sort of constant feeling of insecurity of I'm not being a sort of responsible, fully educated historian, and I don't have enough time to learn how to use all these wonderful tools right. that I want to learn. So a lot to read and a lot to learn. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so one, one thing that um, just a kind of best practice uh, is to pay graduate students who <laughs> work in DH. Mm -hmm. Why are you laughing? Just like you paid the good. Yes. <laughs> well, the, but then, because that addresses that that mm -hmm. that question of the time for labor. Um, because right. if that if that labor is um, uh, it is is paid as a form of TA ship, or um, then it then it's less invisible, um, and it's also less on top of everything else. So. I think um, for for people running projects, to the extent that you can write into those projects um, a, a payment for um, hiring graduate students, then um, then then that becomes a I mean a, a much more manageable uh, model. If the resources are there. Right? Yeah, I, I will say that I don't think that there is any school doing it well. Mm. To be quite honest. I mean, people That's are what really we're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, mm. people are people are shocked when I say that I was at UVA and I didn't even know digital humanities existed until <laughs> I was four years into my graduate career. And it was purely by accident that I found out that one of the major DH centers in the entire world was in the library that I spent most of my time in, wow. <laughs> um, because it was not at all part of the curriculum. Right. And it was not talked about as something that one might want to explore by any faculty who were training graduates. Yeah. And I, I, that's always sort of where it ultimately gets home is yeah. you say to a faculty member who's an expert in a particular you know, sort of historical field, yeah. I need you to also evaluate you know, the quality of this Omeka site that I just built. Yeah. So I, mean, I don't have any... There are these really exciting attempts to rethink things. I mean, Bethany Univisky is uh, really championing the Praxis project through UVA now uh, that's trying to give graduate students like systematic uh, training in DH is part of it, but even that, like, you have to get that fellowship. Sort of, yeah. It's not part of what all graduate students can do. I don't. I don't think it should ever be part of what all graduate students have to do. But it's not. It's not part of the curriculum. You sort of get this other thing, kind of like a fellowship, sort of on top of your regular. Um, so yeah, I mean, even the huge centers of DH, in, you know, Nebraska, UVA. I don't think anyone is actually doing it very well. Um, I, and it's hard too when you have like a student who's interested and they, they have one person on their committee who wants to facilitate that work, but you know other members of the committee who are skeptical and as a grad student, how do you negotiate that? Mm. I mean, I, I, re I remember getting conflicting advice from my readers and it being the worst thing that ever happened, but if it was really like about the substantive nature of the dissertation and not just like the direction of this like, paragraph, I mean, that would be even harder mm. to wrestle with. Yeah, John, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, I was just thinking of different models of training. One thing I've been, I've been thinking of since a little bit of an institute, like a, just a disciplinary shift out of the English department into the information studies department, um, 
I've been thinking about PhD training and models uh, for, for that and thinking, you know, often somebody will get a, ma a master's degree on the way up, right? Why does it have to be a master's degree in the discipline mm. you're doing your PhD in? I don't, I'm, I'm not, I mean, we give them after exams, right? So right. there's that. It's like, I'm thinking at my institution, I don't know why somebody could not get a master's in information studies that would qualify them for a museum work, archival work, mm. um, rather than what actually happens is somebody graduates with their PhD in English or history, and then they come into our program for another two years to get it. Um, so like, I, I would just ask us all to be thinking about those models and where mm. and what, where else. You know, people are taking coursework in, in, in computer science. I mean, what would it take to like do do a master's degree that focused on databases while you're also on database design and development while you're also on your way towards a PhD in history? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, I took four pro seminars in the course of my graduate education, and <laughs> they were all just about theory. I mean, all that. They, they were almost all theory seminars. And I think, I think you know, for those of you who teach pro seminars, like to spend, a, spend a unit on DH. I think it's something that anyone, I mean, Ryan, you said you didn't think it should be required, but I think that there, we're getting to where there should be an expectation that you can, if you're conversant in it, then I think working it into your graduate pro seminar, if your institution offers one or something like that, you know, spending some time on that so that your grad students can at least so what's beginning to happen, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'll shut up in a second. Well, what's beginning to happen is as there have been more DH hires, you are now seeing more departments offering like an intro to DH, which is what I taught here. I taught a graduate seminar here. And intro to DH is great, kind of, uh, but you know, if I talk to the students who are really interested in doing DH in their work, mm -hmm. that class, all it does is sort of, well, uh, we spend a day doing a little mapping, we spend a day mm. looking at text. Well, they, they don't develop any substantive skills in that, in that class. Now, maybe it suggests the skills that they want to go and develop independently. But, you know, we've been talking at Northeastern about how we might structure a graduate curriculum that would give interest stu interested students the chance to do more than just the intro mm. to the H. So they could take a course with me on mapping, maybe a course with Ben Schmidt on text mining. So these more kind of honed courses that have to do with what they want to do for their research. There are not many departments that have enough faculty to offer a suite of courses. Right. Well, um, and, and also, the t I mean, you, you have the center of the lab here, but it's, I, I'm in the position of having a colleague who can teach text mining, and we have no uh, uh, concrete physical support, <laughs> right? No lab space, no, you know, so no infrastructure. I, I wonder whether consortial, whether there's an intermediate step, would, which would be a consortial step. Go ahead. There is, That's um, what we're talking about. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, there is a group in the Boston area trying to create a consortium um, for teaching on the model of the Women's Studies Consortium mm. uh, that happens, happens in this area. Right. It takes place here. And uh, it's, it's, we're building it slowly. Mm -hmm. But that's the idea, is that, right. is that different institutions would participate in teaching graduate students from all the institutions in some uh, constructive way towards or beyond the introduction. Right. You can get the introductions elsewhere. Great, and they're necessary, yeah. I think, for anybody to even enter the conversation. But yeah, some more in depth. If you, are, if you are a grad student in the Boston area, we're expecting to offer the four first consortial courses next year. Mm -hmm. So yeah. keep an eye out for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have time for one more question. Hester's got it. Yeah. it, it it's not just a, something I was thinking about um, over the course of these couple of days, too. Um, the the time to what we consider publication, uh, this, this is related to my earlier institutional musings. Um, digital humanities projects take a lot of time and they need a lot of resources. So do archival projects. So do most of our projects. It takes can take years to get them into print. They can get years to get them to the state after which they've been submitted to see them into print. Um, it's, which is different from the more of the kind of social media production of the kind of work that we do. Um, the, the day that I, I went on Twitter, uh, I joined Twitter for the first time in the middle of the Kathleen Fitzpatrick talk, uh, <laughs> where she was talking about the fundamentally social nature of publication. Um, 
and was advocating Twitter, this was a couple of years ago, um, and the, the idea of this fundamental sociality of publication was completely and utterly persuasive to me. Um, it means that if you, you have an opportunity to have your work circulate, be in conversation with other ideas before it finds its um, more formal publication model. But uh, I think that for, I, my own misperception had been that digital humanities projects also participate in that same kind of speed and access. Mm -hmm. And what I'm realizing, especially in the last few days, is that that's not true um, with some of these larger and more elaborate and multiply um, configured projects that they take, in many ways, a lot more time. And unlike uh, a, bi a biography, for mm -hmm. example, or an archival research project that can take 10 or 15 years of much travel, which needs its own kind of support as well, you have to be upgrading the technology constantly um, in ways, and again, these are revelations to me, um, and probably not to anybody else in the room who's probably familiar with them. But I was thinking also about the temporality of the, the product, um, not just in terms of the, the bit rot problem, right. but in terms of its um, the point at which, um, when virtualtext.org goes live, and it will still be in process, I guess my question would be, what makes it go live now? Why now? Why is it ready now? Um, mm -hmm versus at some you know, four months ago or two years ago versus a year from now. Does the developer finish building the website? <laughs> <laughs> is that is that the, usually the big criteria? No. No. I mean I mean for, for my feel like we finished the work. Yeah, yeah. I mean I, I want a milestone, right? I mean I think a milestone is important. I want I don't know, I, I want I, I would rather people start sort of exploring what we have now rather than waiting for the get to sort of some pristine state. I, I mean, I realize this is sort of heresy, maybe, but, uh, but I mean, that, that's, that's my feeling. Mm. Yeah, and then there's always the maintenance of projects that come online. So that's the next piece of this, which most projects don't get to. Yeah. But if it's a really successful project, that would have to include its survival, especially in archive, right? its survival for a little bit of time. And that requires more money and more maintenance. And the continued commitment, presumably, of the visionaries who put it together in the first place. Um, it's hard to hand that off. But that's another um, aspect of the collaborative nature of the work, <coughs> is that the collaboration might not just be between faculty members in the English department and the computer science part department, but also with the library that has um, made commitments to preserving the um, and, and maintaining an archive um, so that there's a, a, a layer of institutional support and collaboration that, that makes it possible as well. Yes. On that note, I would urge everybody to start talking to your librarians and activists <laughs> because it doesn't happen overnight. Either. Okay, well I, I hate to do it, but I think that we are, we are reaching our, our conclusion. Um, I, I need to thank several people, my, my co-organizer, uh, Raylan Barnes. <laughs> I don't think she's here anymore. Um, I wanted to thank her this morning, and, and unfortunately it just completely slipped my mind, but uh, Kiki Sanko, who's the uh, administrative mm -hmm. assistant for the Women and Gender Studies program here at Northeastern, and also for the new lab. Uh, who helped make sure that the coffee was here and the tables were where they needed to be and that we had recording equipment all set up and all of the things that uh, I was glad to not have to worry about um, and did just a phenomenal job. So if you get a chance to send her an email or something, please. Um, and then, of course, the, the Rare Book School, the American Antiquarian Society, the, um, the New Lab, the Northeastern Humanities Center, all the people who donated funds to help make this happen and to our wonderful uh, plenary panelists. Thank you. I hope that these conversations do continue as we have said that they would, because it's really been, uh, I'm a little tired, but it's been a great two weeks. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan.